Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you're enjoying the first day of the Great Lakes Science Boot Camp. Um, now that it's about 2.20, we're going to get started with the next session. So my name is Mark Chalmers. I'm a science engineering librarian here at the University of Cincinnati. And as a member of the planning committee, I'm very happy to introduce our next video tour, which is going to be of the Veterinary Medical School at Ohio State University and the different animal hospitals therein. So before I start the video tour, I wanna to let you know to please put your questions in the chat, which I'll be monitoring. And we are joined by Mary Spittler from Ohio State University, who's going to help answer our questions after the video. So before I get started with, oh, we are also joined by Teresa Burns, who can help answer our questions as well. So I'm gonna put this link in the chat, um, which is the website for the Veterinary Medical School. And then we'll go ahead and get started with the tour. I am Mary Spittler, and I am an assistant director at the Veterinary Medical Center, and I am director of marketing and business development. The primary purpose of the facility is actually threefold. Um, one is to educate fourth year, what we like to call graduating professional students, um, as well as interns and residents. Uh, the second purpose, well, there's no real order, but the <laughs> second purpose um, is advancing animal health, animal health and well being, and serving the animal owning community, uh, providing high quality, advanced medical care. Um, the last purpose, if you will, uh, is research, last and certainly not least at any given time. I mean, there are hundreds of research studies going on uh, between, within the College of Vet Med, between preventive medicine, uh, biosciences, and clinical sciences. The VMC, predominantly clinical sciences, although we work with the others, um, and we work with human uh, medicine. Um, for our clinical trials office alone, as part of the VMC, handles 50 plus uh, trials annually. Um, the Veterinary Medical Center at Ohio State is comprised of five different hospitals. Um, we have the Companion Animal Hospital, the Farm Hospital, the Equine Hospital, Galbraith Econic Center. Uh, we have a facility, a satellite facility in Dublin, Ohio, uh, where we have a few specialties and an urgent care. And to our knowledge, the only veterinary urgent care <coughs> in town so far. Um, and then we recently opened our standalone primary care. Uh, the Frank Stanton Spectrum of Care Clinic. So should your animals have a need, um, you can either be referred by your general practitioner or you, you don't necessarily need a referral, uh, but we are a referral med medical center in terms of uh, offering advanced care. Because we are a tertiary 24-7, 365 emergency and critical care hospital, um, we don't typically open it up to outside visitors other than customers. Um, however, that being said, we do offer continuing education to our referral partners, the referring veterinarians in general practice. Um, we have our own CE for internally for faculty and staff, like the veterinary technicians. And if we do any tours uh, per se, we, it would be donors and um, new students coming in who are, are thinking about uh, the veterinary program. We are known for our excellence in advancing uh, animal care um, as well as human care. We are also known for our clinical teaching. Uh, we are ranked fourth in the United States by U.S. News & World Report among veterinary teaching hospitals, something we are very proud of. We, you know, we like to consider the, uh, the cases that walk in the door as the textbooks for our, our students, um, the fourth years as well as the interns and the residents. Um, 
and with 43,000 cases annually, that, that provides a lot of opportunity for clinical teaching. With regard to advancements, um, we are very well known for our uh, integrated oncology, which is medical, surgical, and radiation oncology working together on cases. Several of our faculty are involved in research um, with the comparative and translational oncology signature program in which they're working with members of the, the College of Medicine, um, as well as human hospitals like, such as Wexner and the James. Um, to advance treatments and um, testing for cancer in animals and humans. So the work that we do here can hopefully be translated into human medicine. We also have a couple of um, clinical faculty, faculty who are involved in research around radiation treatments, trying to make them shorter and not have any um, after effects which would be amazing and hopefully then can be transferred to human medicine. We're also working on uh, studies in the treatments for uh, breast and lung cancer. Um, there's actually, it's a round two study right now for that treatment. Some of the other advancements that we're known for um, in our orthopedics service, uh, we do have a world-renowned surgeon who is who has completed over 2,500 uh, hip replacements, uh, double hip replacements, total hip replacements in, in animals, in dogs mostly. Um, and within that service, they're also uh, looking into treatments, um, non-surgical treatments uh, to help with osteoarthritis, which they're also looking at translating to human medicine. Um, other advancements include our um, interventional medicine, which cardiology uses to a great extent and has worked with Nationwide Children's Hospital on some cases. Um, our neurosurgery team and our internal medicine team, the internal medicine team has made great strides in terms of uh, gastroenterology treatments for that, for kidney disease and kidney dialysis, and they are doing a lot of studies related to felines. Backing up all of those advances, of course, is uh, human-grade technology. Uh, from a radiology standpoint, we, we offer a three Tesla, which is a, a machine large enough to um, do MRIs on horses. Um, so that has been a, a great plus for us, and um, a very quick 128-slice CT. Our folks at the VMC, um, this includes first through fourth year students, residents, interns, grad students, faculty, uh, use library resources, the veterinary library in particular, um, for a multitude of things. Um, it could be anything from um, research that's being done, could be for specific cases that are being seen, uh, to be able to look look things up electronically instantaneously when they're looking for information based on a case that they're seeing. Um, it also, you know, residents, there's special reading lists for residents, there's um, guides to help with uh, preparing for the boards, uh, the licensure program. Um, there are industry guides um, for evidence-based learnings that are applied to, to cases that we see, um, students one through four use them use the electronic textbooks. Um, there's just there are so many applications for the materials with the, the library. Even developing uh, coursework for students, the faculty use it for that. If money were no object, we would invest in people. Um, it's not we, that we don't have enough people to deliver the high quality care that, that we strive to do every day. Um, it's just that it would make it a little easier. <laughs> it, it would allow people to operate at the top of their, of their ability um, on every level. So from staff to student to resident to faculty. Um, with 43,000 cases, it's, it's a little tough 
uh, at times, um, especially now during the pandemic with the onslaught of, of new, newly adopted animals, which is a good thing, but, um, but I think the industry as a whole was hit pretty hard. So people, people would definitely be where we put the money. If you wanted to learn more, you could visit vet.osu.edu slash VMC. And our phone number is 614-292-3551. So I see we do have one question here in the chat and um, Mary, Teresa, whoever wants to field that, please feel free to either respond in the chat or unmute and answer um, over the mic. Thanks. That's a, this is, um, this is Teresa Burns. Uh, that's a great question. And I'm sure Mary could probably weigh in from the small animal side, but uh, on the large animal side of the VMC, we, um, <laughs> we've seen, we, you know, routinely we'll see animals like, um, we probably see a few zebra a year, the farm animal department sees camels, camelids, um, we'll occasionally see animals from um, the zoo, from the wilds. Uh, we, we, we see quite a few, but most of them are the, the regular eight domestics. So we're talking about a, you know, 99 to one kind of kind of ratio. Everything that's not a person, that's what we see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would just second that. I mean, the most unusual that I've actually seen uh, were tigers and um, and cheetahs. <laughs> but Interesting this is not story on a, about the tiger on a regular bit. basis. Exactly. The, um, you know, when Mary said uh, tigers, a lot of times, so we saw a few years ago, there were a couple of, a couple of tigers from, uh, from a traveling circus operation that actually came into our soft tissue surgeons to be spayed. Um, but as you might imagine, they travel in these very large um, metal crates, secure, of course, with wheels. And so they wheel them around. Well, there's nowhere really in our small animal hospital that's big enough to put those crates. And so they parked them at the end of our equine orthopedic ward. And, you know, we had, we had a few horses in there um, that were, that were in for procedures and they were, they were unhappy all day. You know, all the little rumblings and grumblings coming from the end of the ward from those tigers sitting in their, in their cages made uh, the horses quite restless that day. And so none of us really knew what was back there until we started asking questions. We're like, oh, there's tigers back at the end of our equine ward. So um, we're sort of a be like the willow and bend kind of crew over at the VMC. <laughs> um, I'm noticing a couple other questions um, to speak a little bit more about the newly adopted pandemic pets. Um, and is there anything about the clients or animals that stand out, or is it just the volume? Speaking for, uh, Teresa, you could speak to the equine section, but speaking mostly for a small animal, um, we have seen an exorbitant amount of new uh, clients and animals. And what stands out, what stands out is, and I'll be very uh, frank, <laughs> is that some of the, uh, clients aren't uh, aware necessarily that they could they could be taking cases to their general practitioner or maybe they don't have one um, so there's a learning curve just getting them to understand that we we are uh, well the VMC itself is a, uh, a specialized care hospital now that we open the primary care clinic we can direct people if they don't have veterinarians, um, family veterinarians, but um, but there's definitely um, been people bringing cases in that don't necessarily need to be seen by us. Teresa, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. You know, I don't think we have too much to add to that from the new animal perspective on the large animal side. Um, I think we saw a little bit of the 
a little bit less of the pandemic pet phenomenon in horses and live, other livestock, but we, we did notice that, that um, you know, some of our work is very seasonal and we tend to be very, very busy in the springtime when, when youngsters are being born and, there's, and it's breeding season. And so what we did notice last year and this year in spring of 2020 and 2021 is that it didn't slow down at all. Um, and it was an interesting thing. I mean, obviously we didn't have to deal with what the small animal folks did, but we did, we had a uh, contracted personnel in the hospital for a lot of reasons. And in the face of this, you know, this caseload that, that remained to be serviced, it was, they had us all on our toes. We were hopping. We all got our steps in every day this spring. It's just starting to kind of slow down at the moment, actually. Oh, the incident a few years ago when your facility yeah. cared for a horse was set on fire. Yeah. So that horse, his name is North Star. And he was, um, that actually happened, that's probably close to 10 years ago now, actually. That was what, 2012 or 13, I think. And yeah, that was a horse from Pennsylvania, in case um, the, the, who was asking about where our cases come from. That horse came from Pennsylvania. He was uh, he was maliciously injured. He was doused in alcohol and and set on fire. And that was actually a really, uh, turned out to be a really neat collaboration between folks in the Galbraith Equine Center and folks at the Wexler Medical Center. So we worked, uh, one of our clinicians that cared for that horse um, worked very, very closely with folks over in the burn unit at the Wexler Medical Center. And we, they actually ended up using some novel medical and surgical therapies to take care of that horse who went home by the way, and is to my knowledge, I haven't talked to anyone involved in that for probably a couple of years now, but last I heard about him, he was doing well uh, back in PA. I don't know if Mary has heard from more from them. Um, there's now a, a fund set up in his honor, his name at the VMC to that pe that folks can donate to, to care for, or to provide indigent care for, for large animals, sort of like a good Samaritan fund for, um, for large animals in our hospital. So that's our, we have a North star fund now and it's because of him. So I don't know if you can answer the question about um, what animals do we treat that have biologies that are most different from humans? Oh, Would that man. be horses? I don't know. That's a, well, it kind of depends. So that's a really interesting question because it really does depend on what specific area of anatomy or physiology you're talking about because they all have something that's somewhat unique. I mean, the interesting thing is that there's, you know, for example, um, if we're talking about you know, absorption of drugs from the stomach. Pigs and horses are more similar to humans than cattle and goats and sheep are. Um, dogs and cats are more similar to people than cattle and goats and sheep are. If you're talking about, um, you know, something that we talk about an awful lot in, in our little area of the, of the um, hospital is endocrine diseases of horses and ponies. And, you know, horses and ponies have uh, endocrine disorders that are very similar to humans that are pre-diabetic, but as opposed to people who are who end up becoming to becoming type two diabetic, horses don't do that very often. So they'll they'll churn along in pre-diabetes for twenty years and never become diabetic, whereas you know a person would become diabetic fifteen years before that. So there's that that's one of the really neat things about vet med is that the number of species differences. It's always interesting. It's it's always kind of a you know, there's a lot of brain ticklers and teasers happening over here. Some what's sometimes kind of frustrating is we can't often extrapolate directly just off the cuff without asking the question and doing the research, which is where our which is where our folks in the library come in um, and help us quite a bit. Um, there's not a lot of assumptions to be made because things can sometimes be quite different. There's a couple other questions. Um, is there any community outreach cooperation of equine therapy and or animals assisted placement for people with disabilities? Oh my gosh, this is a fantastic question. And I actually, this one, this one kind of strums a chord. And I actually, I was looking at my, in my email this week, I have an email from um, a gal who works with an EGALA based equine assisted therapy organization over in Pataskala on the east side of Columbus. Um, and we, we actually do. So we, four or five years ago, um, in the College of Vet Med, the College of Social Work, um, and our uh, community partner, PBJ Connections, did a study looking at the efficacy of equine-assisted therapy 
um, for elder adults with cognitive and physical impairment. And so and what, we, what we showed was that it turns out people really do like hanging out with horses and it's not just, um, it's not just, uh, it's not just on the surface. There actually are some real tangible beneficial effects of um, equine assisted therapy. And so we're very interested actually in our group in, in pursuing that further and actually looking to see if this might be beneficial for other groups. And this particular community partner is doing work with veterans, uh, is doing work with, with, um, with, with teenage individuals with various and sundry um, difficulties with, with home and school. And so, um, yes, we do have community partners that are working with us to evaluate this very thing. It's a very good question. I'm so glad you asked it. It's great work. Do horses enjoy the interactions as much as the humans do? Well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> I'll tell you what makes them love it. Um, we offer them an awful lot of treats. We figured that everyone needs to benefit from this. And, you know, we've actually, so we, we, we use an awful lot of uh, peppermints. We use an awful lot of, of other things that horses like. Um, and so they certainly, they seem to seek it out. We certainly don't force them to do anything. And, you know, there's always concern about that when we're, whenever we're employing animals for some use of, for human benefit, we need to make sure that we're not, and, and from a veterinary perspective, we're very, we're very keen to ensure that we're not incurring any harm on their behalf. And so we've actually done some studies looking at cortisol and other markers of stress in horses that are used for therapy. And it turns out the folks who are involved in receiving the equine assisted therapy, their cortisols often go up in a good way <laughs> in anticipation of some of these therapy episodes, but the horses are cool as cucumbers and they seem to, they seem to enjoy the interaction, at least, you know, as far as we can tell from their external behavior. So that's also a really good question. It's, oh, Newfie agrees with copious treats. <laughs> oh, Newfies are the fit. They, you know, every Newfie I've ever met, I love. And whenever they sit, they always manage to sit on a foot. I think they trap you deliberately. They stay with me. Wonderful. Um, I, I saw there was a question about if we've seen any cases of COVID-19 that are transferred from humans to companion animals. Um, if so, how common is this? I don't, I mean, you may know more than I do, Dr. Burns, but I don't recall hearing about any in our hospital? Correct. No, that's, that's, that's correct. We, to my knowledge, we haven't documented any human to animal transmission in our hospital. Um, and, and there was, you know, there were, there are a few reports from both the United States and internationally of various species of companion and production animals that were infected with COVID-19, likely from exposure to people. It seems to be a very uncommon event. And obviously once we heard those reports, we began to look and be very critical of those events occurring in our case population. And to my knowledge, we haven't documented any and it's not, it's not for lack of, lack of looking. So it appears to be, it appears to be rare. Um, the risk for our personnel is in, um, and in transmission in our operation is from, from obviously the, the human animals associated with the veterinary animals that are coming in with them. So that's, that's kind of where the, that's our experience. Interestingly though, I will say that horses have their own coronavirus. They get a coronavirus disease and we've known about it for a long time. We see it every year during diarrhea season. And so we all, th we all thought like, oh gosh, next year, what are we gonna do when we have to diagnose a horse with coronavirus and everyone freaks out. And then we have to say, no, 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 just wait, this is the horse one. And we, we had a whole script all planned out and it, it actually didn't turn out to be as big of an issue as we thought it was. But um, most veterinary species have some kind of coronavirus that they get. It's a very, it's a very diverse viral family. Another question, what are the most common types of surgeries you do? Oh my gosh. Well, I said, Mary can talk about the small animal side. She, I saw John Dice favorite, you know, figuring, figuring prominently in that, in the video, but on the equine side, we, we do an awful lot of abdominal surgery. The vast majority of our surgeries are what we call colic surgeries for horses that have big, bad belly aches that we need to fix on emergency for an emergency purpose. But we do, you know, like the small animal side, orthopedic surgeries, airway surgeries, um, a lot of the same, the same things that you would see in a human hospital, save, you know, those species that don't have a gallbladder or an appendix like a person. Yeah, on the small animal, <laughs> small animal side, orthopedics for sure. Um, 
are very common. Um, AC, torn ACLs and um, Dr. Dice, especially with the hip replacements. Um, and we do that out of both our Dublin practice as well as on campus. Um, I would also say, you know, from a, an oncology standpoint, um, there are a lot of uh, surgeries related to, to mass removal, et cetera, um, that, are also, that are also common. Um, all I know is our surgery team is quite busy these days. <laughs> so, um, oh, Daniel asked, diarrhea season? <laughs> I just I just typed a reply to that. That's a really good question. I was wondering if anyone anyone caught that. Um, yeah, in, in a lot of in a lot of livestock species, some of the diarrhea diseases that we see have a very seasonal distribution because they are insect vectored. So most of the time, they're happening uh, when there's insects around. So right now we are in the thick of diarrhea season, mm. <laughs> which is why I said I'm going to go do a webinar. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Any integrative therapies, acupuncture? Well, I know in our canine rehabilitation service, they do do acupuncture down there. Um, my dog actually went through it, actually enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> it was either that that he enjoyed or the frozen yogurt they gave him. Um, I don't know, uh, Teresa, if you are, if you could talk to the integrative therapies at all or Mm -hmm. We don't we don't do an awful lot of it in our hospital, um, but we have a lot of, of large animal primary care practitioners that do a lot of acupuncture and chiropractic. It, those are very common uh, modalities to use, particularly in equine practice. So yes, that's right. Oh, I see. You're very quick to answer these in writing. <laughs> um, the Stanton grants feeding system to methods to increase affordability and access to veterinary care. Can, oops, can you speak a bit about the new, uh, the VMC, how the VMC handles affordability and related issues? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, as far as the Stanton clinic goes, uh, the way that students are being taught and they've always been taught is to, um, to consider the whole situation. So the pet and the family and um, use critical thinking skills to determine different um, different treatment plans based on, on the diagnosis relative to what the owners um, are able to do, willing to do. I mean, it's not just automatically going to the highly technological solutions, but just really trying to find the best solution on a case-to-case -case basis, um, looking at looking holistically at the situation. Um, as far as, um, I'm trying to remember what your second part of that question was, uh, what the VMC is doing. I mean, from an affordability standpoint, I mean, we do offer care credit. Um, we do have discounts for certain groups, but you know, unfortunately, much like human medicine, we're using the same type of equipment, same drug. So the cost is unfortunately what it is, especially in specialty care. Um, but we do have different programs also, uh, to, if the prognosis is good to try to offset some of the costs in certain cases. So basically we do everything that we can do within reason, um, to make, to make vet care more affordable. Um, there's a lot of questions here. <laughs> Before we get too far ahead, I saw there was one about if you have many international students. Um, Teresa, again, you might know more than I do about that one. You know, I don't know what the what our percentage is, but we do have we do have a number of international students. And actually, just thinking back from an individual student perspective, they are from all all over the globe. So um, Southeast Asia, South America. Um, it's yes, we do. We do take international students. Obviously, um, they're they're we, we probably have somewhere between five and ten per class. That is that is that's a guess on my part, but that's just an estimation from from who I interact with on a daily basis. But 
Um, yeah, it actually, you know, where that where that came to a bit of a head in the last year is some of our international students having really um, terrible problems uh, trying to uh, being prohibited from going home or being restricted from going home during the last year of travel. So obviously this, I mean, it's been hard for everyone, obviously, but they, um, for, for folks whose, whose family is, is out of the country, it was particularly poignant. Um, the question about, do we work with behavioral and emotional issues? Uh, yes, mm -hmm. we do have a behavior service um, who, who are heavily involved in that. And um, especially one of the main focus now is to get the word out there to help educate uh, owners, especially dog owners, uh, as people begin to return to work um, and how to try to offset potential separation anxiety because we are trying to also offset pets ending up in return to shelters or rescues um, as people return to work. There's a lot of fear around that. Um, but our behavior service is uh, very well known and um, and quite busy. Um, as far as is acupuncture taught in vet school, um, I don't know the answer to that, Teresa. Do you? I know that uh, Dr. Markley, um, in our in our uh, canine rehabilitation service, um, I'm not. As really far sure. as wildlife goes, so we don't do. And actually, I'll um. So funny story an anecdote, if you will. I was walking back, my office is in a separate building from the VMC. And so I was walking um, to my office uh, a couple weeks ago uh, in between appointments. And, and there was uh, two gentlemen following me in a, in a gator. And I was like, well, maybe they're just trying to get somewhere else. And no, they were following me. And I had my earbuds in, so I couldn't really, uh, didn't hear them when they were saying, hey, excuse me. So they pulled in front of me and stopped. <laughs> And there were two folks who were working on some of the construction projects that are going on all around the VMC. And I looked in there, you know, the, what, they waved me over and one of them had a deer fawn in his arms. And he said, hey, we found this on 315, which is a large freeway running next to the, running next to the VMC, Columbus. And they said, we found him on the freeway and we thought that he was hurt and he, he looked like his leg was hurting him. Can you help? And so I took him. And I walked back over to our food animal department and handed him to one of the, the ruminant clinicians. And usually what they do in the case of, of wildlife, it depends a little bit on the species, but we're um, by law not, not licensed to rehabilitate wildlife in the state of Ohio. So we actually have to call somebody else unless it's something that is an in extremist and needs to be euthanized for humane reasons at, you know, right then. Uh, we usually will call the Ohio Wildlife Center um, or some other context we have for, for treatment and rehabilitation of wildlife, and we will make the exchange. Um, but yes, we, we see them all the time. People bring them in all the time, and we sort of courier them to the proper place um, so they can be cared for. The exception is uh, privately owned wildlife. Like I mentioned zebras earlier and things like that. And Ohio is a place where uh, folks often, um, often own a lot of different exotic species of wildlife. And so those uh, we, we will see and treat on an individual basis occasionally. Uh, there was a question about if we had any words of advice for aspiring students of veterinary science. As a veterinarian, Teresa, I think you can take that. Can you still hear me? <laughs> uh-huh. Okay, I just got onto a, I'm gonna, I'm going to be on the move here, so I just want to make sure. I know, I, I know you have to go. That's why I wanted you to hear everybody. But that words question. of advice, I saw that, and I'll tell you in the chat, I've typed 17 different answers to that question because I think <laughs> this is something, if you were to really want to get the sparkle in people's eyes around here, it's to ask a question like that. What kinds of advice you would give to someone who is who really wants to get into this field? Because, you know, it's interesting. If you poll people in veterinary medicine and ask them when they when they learned or when they knew they wanted to be a vet, they'll often say, before I even went to school, I never wanted to, to do anything else. That's, you know, it's, it's at least a majority of people who say that. And so, you know, I would say for someone who really wants to get into this career, um, you know, visit us either in person when we're able or electronically talk to someone here, talk to lots of people here um, and get their perspectives. Talk to people who are excited about this profession and, and and can tell you the ins and outs of it. So that's um, that would be my off the cuff response to that. But I love that question. And it sounds like you may know what someone who's interested. So you have Mary's contact information. 
please, she'll put you in touch with a whole flurry of people who will give you the, the best and brightest of veterinary medicine. Absolutely. And uh, I can take the, the last question that's here. Um, and thank you, Teresa, because I know you're off to somewhere else. <laughs> uh, but uh, as far as oncology, specialist for oncology, um, we have an integrated oncology team. As I mentioned earlier, there's um, medical oncology, surgical oncology, and radiation oncology uh, with board certified specialists in each area who work together um, on, you know, on the cases that come in. So as they come in, the group collectively decides which, who needs to be involved, which direction to go. Um, I mean, it's very similar to human medicine. Um, well, I see Teresa's comment. Um, <laughs> To human medicine, and uh, we also work very closely with the clinical trials office. Um, oncology is a huge, huge area, obviously, for exploration. Um, if there are more specifics that you'd like to know about about the oncologic specialties and specialists, um, I would direct you to our website, um, or you can share any other questions with me, and I'd be happy to have someone provide more information. Are there any other questions? I don't see anything, but I think I can speak for everyone and just say thank you to um, Mary and Teresa for you know entertaining these questions and sharing their their insight and experience with us. We all really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, and I apologize for my rather low energy in the video. It was a long day, <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>